Chapter 6 Suddenly there was a clatter of hoofs, a voice shouting, Yo-ho! to the calves round the door, and Joe, crimson, breathless, cheery from his mad ride, knocked the mud from his boots and walked into the passage. You'll see your chemise, said Eli indifferently when he heard Joe first. Lily's eyes flickered. Sex, a surface thing with her, but the strongest influence she knew, awoke again and overcame her madness. She fled through the door into the box staircase, taking the rifle with her. Eli sat unmoved as he had been throughout. Joe had meanwhile fallen over the milk pails and was in a sad plight for a night errant. He opened the parlor door and came in, accompanied by a stream of milk. "'Where's Lil?' he asked. "'You're in my debt for all that good milk,' said Eli. "'Even unto the skirts of his raiment,' he added with sour amusement. "'Where's Lil?' Joe repeated. "'Titivating, most likely.' "'There's no light upstairs,' said Joe. Eli was surprised at his acuteness. "'Maybe she's gone to bed,' he amended. "'Well, I want to see her. What for?' "'Mr. Huntbatch, you're her dad, and so I try to be dutiful,' said Joe, with some dignity. "'But when I come to tell her something, I tells her. I don't mouth it to other folks first. "'What do you want, then? Me to call her?' Eli began to feel that Providence was not looking after him in its usual efficient way. I said Joe, now. Eli called up the stairs. There was no reply. Lil, called Joe, and in his rough voice dwelt an amazing tenderness. There was a movement above, and Lily's voice, striving to be as usual, replied, Coming. In a few minutes she came, tear-stained and limp, without the rifle and in her working dress. At sight of her face, Joe opened his mouth to exclaim, Law is me! but closed it again sharply, having suddenly grown from a hobbledehoy to manhood. He stood looking from Lily to Eli with bent brows. Then he turned to Eli and told the only successful lie of his life with the utmost frankness. "'They want to know,' he said, nodding in the direction of High Lee's house, "'if you can spare Lil to go hilling tomorrow. Mother's agreed with the Higgler for a big lot,' and we'm short-handed. I was to take Lil back tonight, if so be she'll come. Oh, you was, was you? Eli was at a loss for once. He perfectly saw through Joe, and at last began to respect him as almost an equal, though grudgingly. Well, of course, if your mother wants her. When the ladies ask, he began. Lil, put your hat on and come along o' me, said Joe. Your father says so. You mun obey him. Slow satire pointed the words. They went out. "'Jump up behind me,' said Joe. "'And Eli,' he called back. "'There's a bit of plaster gone from the wall just above your chair. "'I'd see to it if I was you.' Lily clung to him like a frightened kitten. "'Quiet now, little lass,' he said. "'I heard the shot. "'Which of you was it?' "'Me,' said Lily faintly, and they were silent. "'So they came over bitterly, trotting down the moonlit track, through dark cloud shadows to the Arden's door. They passed the batch stone, a boundary mark intended to be imperishable, but worn down by the rubbing of the cattle against it until the chiseled words were obliterated. So the thou shalt nots of man are erased. Only the great affirmatives stand unscarred, and it seems hardly worth while to spend time on negations. Whitefoot made no sound on the turf. The grouse slept in the deep arched glooms of the heather forest. From the spinney on the left, just before they came out of Hilltop Road into the western part of the Arden Sheepwalk, there smote across them a tide of larch resin and a frothy scent from the elder trees that stood witch-like round the wood. Out in the far lisos, two large enclosures, there was a new tide of fragrance. It came from the young bracken, wild thyme, burnt grass, heather and cloudberry bushes. With them was the austere fragrance drawn from the rock all day by the sun, and now hanseled delicately by moonlight and dew. The cattle crowded up, snuffing, very much at ease, like all animals and primitive people when nothing intervenes between them and immensity. To the west, immeasurably lofty in the flat moonlight, which washed all unevenness from the ridges, stood the devil's chair, silvered ebony, from very far off, like the complaint of a denizen of some other world, 
came the cry of a sheep somewhere in the complex coombs or flats beyond the little wood. As they neared the cottage, a stout lamb with a very tightly curled and close-fitting coat caracoled up with heavy mirth and a long-drawn, deep bass, baa It looked so absurd with its middle-aged figure, bulging forehead, and awkward babyishness that Joe burst into a guffaw. He never, as a rule, saw either humor or pathos in the things that were his daily life. They were just ship, them steers, old Whitefoot, but tonight he was strung to his highest pitch. His nerves were at last existent. He had attained, in minute measure, the sad distinction of the poet, who enjoys because he suffers. The lamb grunted and made off at Joe's, Ha! Ha! Lily woke from a half-doze, irritated. Whatever you be laughing at, you great gom, she began. No, she must not call Joe a gomeral. This was a different Joe. She was frightened of him. Also a faint and very unusual sense of gratitude dwelt in her. The great keen air, like an eager, not coming in several breezes, but in one soundless and indivisible force, smote on Lily's shorn head. Oh, Joe, she whispered, I cannot be seen. My hair... Joe pulled his red handkerchief from his pocket and tied it under her chin. There. There's not a tidier wench in England, he said, with an admiration that was balm to her. She closed her eyes. Tears crept slowly down her cheeks. Inside the house, Mrs. Arden awoke. Somebody laughed out in the pasture, John, she said. Maybe it's the dark riders. Put up a prayer. Now, mother, you're too given up to them old unrighteous tales. But there is someone. Harky, they're tabering on the door. Maybe it's a call for me. She was up and at the window in a moment, flinging on a skirt and shawl. Mother, said Joe's voice, strange yet authoritative. Come down, Ooch. What's come over the lad? Best go down, mother, said John, beginning to dress. And a quiet tongue is the healer. Mrs. Arden went down. "'Here's little mother. Can she sleep along of our Deb?' asked Joe. Lily stood at the door, white, with a scarlet handkerchief bound round her small head, her dress only half-fastened in her haste. She blinked at the candle in a helpless way like a young barn owl. Mrs. Arden looked over her spectacles, first at Lily with solicitude, then at Joe with severe morality, tempered by primitive charity. "'Joe, lad,' she asked, "'is it have you no it inna and i hanna snapped joe crossly you're always harping on one string mother well joe said mrs arden apologetically if a shepherd dunna mind his own sheep walk there's none'll mind it for him but come you in lily my dear she raked the fire and threw dry wood on then hung the kettle over the blaze the place was full of resinous fragrance and warm light joe surveyed the scene standing just outside the door with his head bent to look in his broad shoulders touching the jams. He felt rather like he did on fair days, when the long tramp behind the sheep was over and they given up to their new owner, so that he could go untrammeled and lonely about the fair. The pride of responsibility, the stress of a necessary and difficult job were gone. He was just Joe Arden again. He took Whitefoot round to the stable. Well, Joe, said his father matter-of-factly, what about a bit of supper? I don't know as I want any, father. Deb appeared on the stairs with the little lamp that always burned by her room at night, lit by her father. What's the matter? she asked. Nout, said Joe. Mother'll tell you, he added with sublime faith. Soon there was a comfortable scent of tea. Rover had never known such doings out of lambing time. He was not pleased. The light from the one shilling eleven and a half pence alabaster lamp fell gently on poor Lily sipping thankfully from the best china. Joe, embarrassed but not apologetic, consumed bread and cheese with the enormous appetite of those that come from spiritual heights. John talked of common things in reassuring tones, not understanding the circumstances, but seeing deeper into the infinities. Deb, her straight hair falling in sweet disarray over her old shawl, sat protectingly by Lily, and Mrs. Arden, chatty, Intent as a field marshal deploying before battle, poured tea and buttered bread, with a thrill of unusual excitement with which she met her many sleepless nights, 
a thrill which quite made up for her quiet life and her lost rest. There, Lil, she said, don't you wear it. Deb, you take her up now, and tomorrow we'll go hillin', and Lil will tell us all about it. Her crushed curiosity spoke the all with relish. Lil looked at Deb's long hair, remembered how she had once despised it, and burst into a storm of sobs. Joe looked round accusingly. Nay, nay, said John, don't take on, little un, we am all friends here. Well, Mr. Arden, said Lil, gasping, and Joe and Mrs. Arden, she left Deb out, her hair was so long, so heartbreakingly intact. I'm sure I'm very much obliged, and, and I'll never forget it. No, I won't that. Joe gazed at her over his large cup with love, the white everlasting that grows in simple places flowering in his face. He did not know that to such as Lily the snapping of flowers, even everlastings, was a matter of course. They were things to pick, use, fling away, only blossoms not necessary to anyone like vegetables and meat. So the gospel of the grey-hearted had sunk into Lily's soul, which was meant to be a thing of colour and fragrance, but had been so frozen and stunted that only a poor little empty crevice remained. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 As the grandfather clock struck five with a cherry expenditure of energy, wheezing before each stroke, Mrs. Arden opened the upper flap of the door, shooed the fowls, and looked to see whether it was the man or the woman who stood outside the ornate cardboard weather house. A casel to day, father, she called up. The woman's out. Soon they had breakfast and set out with baskets and large sunbonnets. John had gone with Joe to help in the hay, for it was carrying day, and the windrows must all be spread to dry after the storm, then raked afresh. John's own hay was not yet cut. The little crofts, perched so high in the cold air and the clouds, ripened late. Sometimes it was September before the hay was safely carried, for it had to be done between storms, and storms were many. John cut it with a scythe. Spare and tall in the clear purple morning, he would go up and down with vigorous rhythmic movements, gravely followed by Rover, and a shadow man, a shadow dog, went after them, dark and vast on the green field. Then Mrs. Arden and Deborah came and tossed the grass with a merry talking. On the day when it was ready to be lugged, Joe came home early. A twill sheet on two poles, reminiscent of ambulance stretchers, was piled with hay, and carried by Joe and John as carefully as if it were really an invalid. But if rain clouds blew up, as they generally did, the dignified march changed to a mad rush. Rover, protestingly exchanging his stroll for a trot, was half buried in falling hay, and as Mrs. Arden said, it was one pikeful full for the rick and ten for the mixin, and such a mingy cumumbus as never was. They all regarded lugging the hay as a game of hazard played against the forces of nature, and they played with spirit. Deborah carried dinner in a basket, and Mrs. Arden brandished the inevitable kettle, for the best picking ground was a mile away, and they would spend their noon spell by the little wood. Real picker's weather it is, said Mrs. Arden. Now we've got a start of the rest, let's see if we can get a two, three quarts afore we have our victuals. She bobbed along rosily and somewhat breathlessly, because she talked incessantly between the two enigmas who vouchsafed few remarks. Her intuition had partially unraveled both enigmas, and she made the mistake of most people with intuition. She pulled so hard at her thread that she broke it. Well, Deb, she said after some talk of yesterday's chapel going, I wonder when Mr. Wright's coming along for you, and I wonder what he'll be like. Light-haired, for sure. Folks allus like their opposites. Deborah had decided during the night that she would be an old maid. To blush as she had done in chapel was, she thought, undecent. If she blushed like that during a handshake, what would it be in courting? Also, with Lily tossing beside her in the narrow bed, her cropped yellow head overwhelmingly reminiscent of another, Deborah was sure she couldn't abear marriage. Dear to goodness, she said to herself, how girls can go in for it all beats me, so it does. She looked down at Mrs. Arden with some dignity and some confusion. I'll bide along of you and father and Joe, she said loftily, 
I dunna like the men. Hoity toity, but Joel not bide with us long. No danger. Mrs. Arden turned her artillery on to Lily with somewhat obvious mechanism. He'll be wanting them fowl's feathers I've saved. Plenty of them there are, too, enough to make a nice flat double feather bed. Both girls looked haughtily into the distance. Perhaps he'll marry Lucy Thruckton, Lily said patronizingly. She'd suit him right well, both being rather full in habit. Lily Huntbatch, Mrs. Arden spoke with asperity, dropping her tact for frank curiosity. You keeping a very still tongue in your head about your doings last night. A very still tongue you be. She waited, but Lily said nothing. And it looks queer for a girl to come riding along of our Joe in the black of night with a good home and a middling good father yonder, and me thinking it was the dark riders. Silence. Mrs. Arden's charitable feelings had worn a little thin, as such feelings will when the recipient seems not only ungrateful, but unconscious of them. If Lily had thrown herself on Mrs. Arden's mercy last night, and told her that she and Joe had gone too far, Mrs. Arden would have loved her, fought the world for her. But this cold righteousness was irritating. "'It's no good mum chancing like that, Lily,' she continued. "'You may as well out with it soon as late.' As for Joe, he'll look higher than Lucy Thruckton, I's warrant, and maybe higher than some others that'd make pretty bad wives for all their yellow hair, leaving six quarts of milk to go sour. At this point, Lily's bonnet blew off and she stood revealed. Mrs. Arden gasped. Lily began to cry. Deborah, who had loyally promised not to breathe a word of it, whispered, How could it have come about? There, there, crooned the kind old weather vane. Dunna take on. It'll soon grow. But however did you come to do it? Lily wailed. It won't grow for years and years. I've got to choose between being married looking like a nine pin in a veil or waiting till I'm even older than Deb. The taunt was lost on Deborah because of her last night's resolve, but Mrs. Arden crimsoned with anger. You ungrateful chit, she cried roundly. Five and twenty's young enough for anybody. Dear me, it is. A woman's bones aren't set proper afore that. It's mean little brats of chillin yours will be if you wed this side of twenty-five. But you canna, she added with a smack of the lips. Your hair won't be growed. As you said, you'll look like a ninepin. The humor of this suddenly struck her. She doubled into helpless laughter, slapping herself unmercifully as she always did. Mother, poor Lil's very miserable. I think you might give her a bit of comfort. Deborah was mildly reproving. She felt sorry for Lily. From her aloof height, she was at present icily self-fortified against sex. Lily's obvious sex enchainment was a most pitiful thing. On account of it, she forgave all Lily's little poison darts with large tolerance. Well, I'm sorry if I was nasty, said Mrs. Arden huffily. But to say such things of Deb, and she Joe's sister, and to be so high and mighty with Joe, and never to give me a word in answer, and you don't know your luck in getting Joe, a good lad as ever stepped. All I can say is, as when your time comes, Lily, as a come it will, ninepin or not, and you're crying and sobbing, as you will, for you cry for nout, you'll be glad enough of me then, and of Joe too. I shan't. I shall hate Joe. Lily was furious. "'But it won't never be,' she added hastily. "'Well, time will show,' said Mrs. Arden placably, "'feeling that she had time, nature, and Joe on her side. "'And now, if we're going to get them old berries, we'd best get them. "'They had reached the highest level. "'The budding heather was round them like a dull crimson sea, "'encroached upon by patches of vivid whimberries, "'flecked with leaves of ladybird red. "'In the lustrous air all colours were intensified, "'and far things came close.' The devil's chair loomed over them, for all the distance between, like a fist flourished in the face. It was dark as purple nightshade. The cobalt shadows of clouds swept across the hills in stealthy majesty. From here there was no view of plain or valley. The plateau stretched so far on every side that it shut out everything but the distant hills. A whimbrel cried overhead, shaking its sweet, long-drawn whistle into silver drops, like quicksilver thrown on marble. The ponies drowsed in the swamps. Nothing stirred. They picked for two hours, absorbed and perspiring. 
Then Mrs. Arden, who had been covertly watching Lily as she ate handful after handful, remarked with caustic humor, "'You won't take many berries back for Joe's pie if you pick all the while into Eve's basket.' The two young women were shocked. Like most country girls, they were prudish, somewhat in the manner of medieval nuns, with a very clear knowledge of life as it is, and a sense that only isolation and extreme care can save them from the malaise. Mrs. Arden's frequent allusions to her stomach always made Deborah blush, and once at a cattle fair when her mother had knowingly punched a cow in the ribs and announced with bonhomie to the owner, "'She won't be long,' Deborah had been overwhelmed with shame. "'Well, it must have gone twelve. I want my dinner.' said Mrs. Arden, so they lit the fire and filled the kettle from a wood spring where rare ferns touched it daintily with supple fingers. They sat down in the short shadow. "'There's Mrs. Hotchkiss coming from Mellicott,' said Mrs. Arden suddenly. "'Laws, those boys do grow, and there's Mrs. Palfrey. Fancy bringing that mite Willie. It seems only a day since I was going to and again with him, and him nigh dead of croup. And there's Lucy Thruckton coming like a sleepy bumblebee from Wood's End Way she announced after a period of munching. She sprang up alertly. "'Well, thank God for my good dinner, and I am not going to let that fat Lucy get all the berries,' she said. "'So I am off again.' The two girls stayed in the shade, chatting in a desultory way. The pickers wandered to and fro, lost in distance, appearing out of hollows, passing round the white signposts like dancers in some strange ritual. They stooped for the small purple fruit, wrapped in purple shadow themselves. Little box carts, trundled by urchins, began to fill with berries, heaped in miniature replica of the hills. Shadows began to climb from the coombs, and clouds came faster. The signpost, so lonely in its ring of worn turf, looked with its outspread arms against the dim reaches of heather like a crucifix under the troubled sky. It stood with forlorn gallantry between the coming storm and its prey. It would be lashed by rain all night, lightning would play round it. The pickers, as with some mysterious sense of kinship, circled about it, so disconsolately consoling, it seemed, so like their own destinies. Deborah, looking at it, thought of what her father had said about forked lightning. She wondered if she would ever be lonesome as it was, set up for a sign, a mark for the storm, pointing vaguely, whither? End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Suddenly Mrs. Arden straightened herself, standing at gaze. A stranger was coming over the hill. He stopped by the signpost, seemed to make nothing of it, and came on towards her. "'Can you tell me the way to Lost Within?' he asked. "'Be you him as preached yesterday?' parried Mrs. Arden. "'Yes.' She was taking him in. "'A comely chop,' she said mentally. He stood looking down at her amusedly, conscious of his good looks. Even his up-to-date blue suit did not spoil his supple muscularity, though it was cut absurdly. He was smoking a briar pipe of enormous proportions. "'Quite our Joe's sort,' commented Mrs. Arden. Joe's sort was, of course, young manliness personified, just as Deb's sort was perfect maidenhood and John's sort something that brought tears to her eyes when she sat and thought her own thoughts in chapel. "'The signpost doesn't say much,' she added. "'Oh, that,' she commented with much scorn. "'Nobody takes no notice of that. You canna go by signposts here. You mun go the way the hills will let you. But them poses,' she added, "'they do for the counting councils to be busy about, painting the names and that. Else who knows what they'd be doing?' for a more mischievous set of men there never was. Besides, poor things, they want to seem to be doing something for their money like other folks. He laughed. The two girls by the wood jumped, looked, and sat mute, expectant. And the way, he reminded her, she had made a resolve. Now, it being so hot, she said persuasively, what did you say to a cup of tea? Well, I'm sure I'm much obliged, but... "'Come you on,' said she with authority. "'Come you on and set you down.' "'Well, to goodness,' breathed Deborah. "'Mother's bringing him here.' Lily skillfully made the most of her front hair under the bonnet. She would see if she couldn't cut Deb out, although her curls were gone. 
girls shrieked mrs arden while yet a long way off there's some one as you both knows for the second time deborah's eyes met those of the stranger lily said mrs arden run and get some sticks while i fetch the water there's a good girl she hustled lily into the wood and so i've got my second chance said stephen southernwood deborah was silent i never saw a soul except you in chapel he continued deborah twisted her apron into a rope my name's stephen might i ask yours he had more ease of manner than any one she knew although he had not attained the absence of self-consciousness which the lord of the manor down at sleep had gained not without tears at eton and which joe had always possessed as a birthright at present he was going through a strange experience he was meeting his primitive self for the first time it was a very shadowy self so far but it was something quite different from the nice young man who had caused such a stir among the ladylike drapery assistants in silverton what had caused the change he did not know was it the hills the storm the clear still face beneath the darkened chapel window since yesterday deborah's face vital yet unawakened had come before him in flashes vivid and transient this transience had stirred desire in him he was ever for the fleeting rainbows of life and what was denied he must possess her evident capacity for large life fascinated him and the veil of sleep that was upon her fired him to awakening onslaught like the suns upon a dim country life ceased to appear as a neat correctly docketed arrangement of a little football a little huxley to improve the mind a little sherlock holmes relaxation a little religion respectability how it did appear he would have been ashamed to say the drapery assistants had made him feel smoothly romantic they themselves were smooth in manner and they saw to it that in their presence life had no rough edges the utmost propriety the utmost glossing of facts was necessary in order to pass muster with them they were cool collected conventional he suddenly hated them in their smoothness they had smoothed him also as a rolling pin smooths dough they had deferred this curious electric mad meeting with himself he had sampled the pleasure of a kiss fairly often but his world had been far removed from the forcible kisses of desire the indecent snatching of the starving for bread the hot struggle for existence he had been detached and impersonal about the great facts of life now they were hot and clamorous in his ears he looked swiftly at deborah and immediately all that he had ever read about the embraces of lovers came into his mind as a poignant personal matter she turned her head away for the look in his eyes was like a strong clasp of her his thoughts galloped he dragged at the reins, intuitively feeling such thoughts to be indecent in Deborah's presence, but they were not to be stopped. They rushed on through the whole of human experience. It lay open to him as the countryside below did, vast, delicate, savage. Kissing ceased to be a game. It was a key to intenser life. The act of speech was no longer merely for courtesies, expressions of opinion, pleasantries, it was for demanding joy from the world, surrender from women. The hearth-fire, little houses, night, took upon them the magic that they wear for lovers. For the first time in his life he realized death, the murderer of ecstasy. Rapture, relentlessness, force, these ceased to be words. They were manhood, they were himself. Tears, tenderness, pain... These were a woman, these the woman who loved him would be and suffer in the glory of surrender, in the birth pang. All these things, dim and half understood, flashed through his protesting mind, while Deborah sat, constrained and afraid to look round, gazing into the melting distance. A voice far down in Stephen's being answered the whimbrel that called above. It summoned Deborah peremptorily. It shouted defiance at the hills, the world beyond, the intangible and therefore terrible depths of blue air. Out of the muddle of half-understood ideas, small wishes and conventions that had concealed Stephen Southernwood from himself, sprang a creature direct and impulsive as the old gods, 
who took their way unknown and unhindered, claiming with a nod the love and tears of the witless daughters of men, themselves wrecking nothing of a love that is pain, only knowing a swift desire, shattering to the desired. So he entered into half his heritage, the physical glory of man. The other half was so far undreamed of. "'Why do you look away all the time?' he asked. She turned her head with an effort. "'Where do you live?' was the next question, direct to rudeness. Yet she felt a delicious homage in it. She nodded sideways. "'Upper leisures. Can I come to upper leisures?' "'I... no,' he laughed. "'You funny little girl.' She had never been called little. She was indignant for a moment. Then she found it sweet. She felt happy and humble-minded as she did when they sang in chapel of sin and forgiveness. "'I tell you what,' said Stephen, "'I shall come to upper leisures and the rest of em, whether you say I can or not.' Deborah's apron was a long, creased rag. "'You've not told me your name yet.' "'Deborah. Shall we go for a stroll in all that green and red stuff, Deborah? What's it called? Wimberry wires. When they call us, we won't go.' "'Mother'll holler till we do,' said Deborah matter-of-factly, but she went with him. For the first time in her life the heather was only a carpet, the sky only a roof. She walked between them in a shaken world to a sound of shaken music. The wimbrel's cry fell there like broken glass, and in her soul the crystal of her pride shivered into fragments. Lily, who had been listening behind a stunted may-tree, stamped with rage, and was what Mrs. Arden called Almighty Imperent. "'Why should I call them Lily Huntbatch?' "'It looks bad. Not as bad as you looked in the dark of night along of our Joe with your dress only half done up.' Lily was silent, but she thought ecstatically how she would try and capture Stephen, throw Joe over and be quits with Mrs. Arden. "'Here they be, friendly as calves or a gate,' said Mrs. Arden, forgetting her annoyance. "'He's a deal taller than Joe,' said Lily, "'head and shoulders. "'That he's not. Joe would be above his ear. "'I've notched him and Deb year by year on the door, and I know.' Lily watched Stephen. "'The chief among ten thousand, she murmured, with a cheap emotion of her kind, often mistaken for love, altruism, religious fervor. "'You're the chief of all gomerals, Lily,' said Mrs. Arden. Then she surveyed Deborah. "'Took for matrimony,' was her comment. "'I think it's very vulgar,' Lily remarked, "'to talk about marrying and kids all the time like some do. "'I can't see why a chap can't talk to a girl without such things being thought of. "'No more do I. Only they dunna, you least of all. "'And as for vulgar, if such things be vulgar than you and me and the greatest in the land, "'I, even the ministers of God's vulgar,' for they're all the sins that such things come to pass. And come to that, she added, rising to metaphysical heights, come to that you'd call the Lord himself vulgar, you wicked girl, for didn't he plan it all out from the first kiss to the last christening? Answer me that, little hunchbatch. She gathered breath as Deborah and Stephen came up. This is Lily Huntbatch that's walking out with our Joe, she announced. The look Lily gave her was venomous. "'Do you like walking out, Miss Huntbatch?' "'Depends who with.' Her bewildering smile was lost. He was looking at Deborah. "'Your safety pin's undone, Deb,' she snapped, "'and your belt's crooked.' "'Here's Lucy after some tea, I suppose,' said Mrs. Arden. "'She's terrible earnest for victuals, Mr. Southernwood, "'and she does credit to him. Lucy bore down on them. "'Well, you are hot,' said Lily, "'welcoming a victim for her anger.' I be that, and red in the face, I allus am. Your hat's all collie wesson. It do get like that, and your brooch is coming off. If I loses him, I loses him, said Lucy calmly. Lily gave it up. If Lucy was too inert to mind about her brooch, given her by her only admirer at the age of twelve, with Mizpah on its moonlike surface, she was invulnerable. "'There, Lucy, my dear, you shall have a nice cup of tea,' Mrs. Arden spoke protectingly. "'Thank you kindly,' Lucy replied, rapaciously and gratefully. "'I'm sure I'm ready for buckets full. The sweat's poured off me till I feel right thin.' At this remark, Stephen was seized with uncontrollable laughter. 
and he stuffed his handkerchief into his mouth, Mrs. Arden recounted to John afterwards, and he rocks to and again like me with the colic. I never seed anyone laugh like what he did. Eh, I like good laughers. Ill they may do, but they're not bad-hearted, not if they laugh till it hurts them. And then Deb started to laugh, and I couldn't help but join, and Lil, as had been sitting all the while like an owl with the face ache, began to say, hee-hee, very mincing-like, and poor Lucy, never knowing what it was all about, opened her mouth and bellowed, and the old Wimblers set up a din of laughing round about. You never heard such a noise in your life, father. And then all of a sudden the thunder came on, and we were all in a pretty taking, and Stephen, he says I'm to call him by his given name, remembered as he ought to have been at Lost Within hours ago. He'd stayed the night at Wood's End along with the storm, and he ran one way and we the other, and poor Lucy went lolloping home, fritten to death. Deborah went awful quiet when it came on to thunder, and she says, Good evening, very stiff to Stephen, as if she'd minded something again him. And when we were coming back, she says, Mother, there's summat foreboded. Aye, she said that yesterday. Well, better go the way of woman, whatsoever's foreboded, said Mrs. Arden. Why, goodness, there's Eli rapsing through all this rain. He's come for Lil, sure to be. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 Eli had passed a very irksome and busy day, for he managed to get a great deal of work out of Lil, feckless as she was. He had been obliged to strain the milk, light the fire, and get his own breakfast. He had forgotten to feed the young turkeys, and three of them had passionately and poetically died, to spite him, as he said. The cow Lily always milked had kicked him, objecting to his hard hands. He had cut himself while peeling potatoes. Altogether, he emerged from his single-handed contest with inanimate matter and what he called brute beasts, somewhat battered. Also, he had been again troubled with a curious sense of admiration for Lily, realizing that if she had spirit enough to behave as she did last night, she could do most things that she chose. She could make a darn sight better butter, nor what she does, he grumbled, if she could shoot her father. He had felt rather startled on coming down in the morning to see the long golden locks on the floor. I've been a fool, he said. When'll she catch a husband now as she's nothing to take the eye? Altogether, it appeared to him that it would be a forgiving and dignified thing to go and fetch her back again. The prodigal daughter, he thought with a wry smile. Well, she went to get much but husks at John's. Poor as a winter felled fire. No yed for business. Keeps that great strapping girl of his eating her head off at home and doing naught. Work them and marry em, I says. Keep em hard at it and they un a kick. He suddenly remembered that Lily had kicked and was displeased. Gear up, he shouted at old Speedwell, his brown pony, now sprinkled with white. She moved away slowly, and he threw a stone after her. Worth twenty women, that hoss is, he murmured, apparently to the Almighty, to whom he spoke frequently and familiarly. Never say die, her won't. He threw another stone. You could not throw at the Almighty or Lily, and he had a need to throw, yet he was fond of Speedwell in his naughty and sapless way. He put on his old round felt hat, very high and pointed in the crown and broad in the brim, and set out. He felt that he was under an obligation to Mrs. Arden for Lily's board and lodging for the night. This hurt his pride. And me with all that money, he said. A present was a thing, but what present? He did not intend to give anything for which he had or might have any use, nor anything for which he could possibly get any money. It was very awkward. Everything he saw was of use, or might be. The gooseberries were overripe, but Lily could make a pie. The ardent should not have them. There were some chickens with the gapes, but he could, no doubt, cure them. No, he would keep the chickens, but he must take something. He looked round the parlour. His eye fell on the manuscript volume of imprecatory psalms, copied out by Lily on Sundays during her childhood, under Eli's tight-mouthed supervision. Yes, he would take that. He came out and tumbled over the prostrate bodies of the three dead turkeys. He would take them, too. May as well be handsome while you're at it, he said. They can make a pie. 
it won't be no worse than young rook pie and that great gawk joe'll be glad of summat to fill his belly so he set out with the psalms under his arm and the turkeys bunched in his hand summat for you missus he said grandly as patty came to the door take em a free gift they be free as the lord's pardon and i want that darter of mine the prodigal darter she is and her loving father's come all the way to fetch her say she's to look sharp it was late and supper was laid joe and his father had just come in and were washing in the back kitchen lily was in deborah's room reading an old-fashioned paper she sprang up when she heard her father's voice looking wildly round for a way of escape mrs arden called her lily put on deborah's sunbonnet a blue one that suited her looked in the glass decided that she was not attractive enough for her object and turned in the collar and a little of the front of her dress to show her white throat then she very softly climbed out of the low window and dropped on the turf joe she whispered through the back door when john had gone to speak to eli i don't let him take me joe not to-night right you are and joe i will you come out along the hill a bit when he's gone i will that said joe when be she coming asked eli from the door supper no i want to take any victuals off you poor things mrs arden sniffed say she's to come this instant minute said eli and joe loomed over him a word with you eli he said hark at our joe calling him eli said mrs arden to deborah did you ever hear the like it's always been mr huntbatch afore what is it now asked eli crustily moving off with joe she's not coming to-night well of all the imperence she's got to come not to-night and what good'll she be in the market when she's bided two nights along of you snarled eli joe's hand was heavy on his collar none of that eli he said loose me be and what'll she please to do after to-night i dunno will she come home to her loving father i shouldna think so what then may happen she'll marry me if she'll take me oh ho and what'll you give me to make up for the loss of my dairy-maid i've nought to give oh yes you have you've got bone and muscle and you can ride if i give my loving consent to this here holy estate will you give your written word to round up my sheep when i ask you maybe that'd be every night said joe dryly only now and again eli reassured him and a bit of help at sheep shearing well i dunna mind that but now in writing and i don't know if she'll take me yet ho oh, listen what i'm going to tell you she'll drop into your arms like a blighted apple anything to get away from her devoted parent but all as i do for you is done on one condition said joe you say now to bout last night well i dunno as i want to on your word of honour continued joe no that's no good on your credit as a moneyed man i swear said eli solemnly end of chapter nine chapter ten when he had gone lily crept out of her hiding-place in the wood-house and met joe on the hill she had no idea that he was going to ask her to marry him and so by the irony of things she spent more time and energy luring him on than she had ever spent over anything my lil you do look pretty why don't you allus turn your dress in lily smiled what was it you were going to say about my arms on sunday joe as i wanted to touch em well you can joe's hand went gingerly up and down one arm do you like me joe like you oh laws well then would you like to put your arm round me let's sit down lil joe was quite overcome he had always thought askin to wed was as difficult as catching sparrows in open weather and now here was fate playing into his hands it seemed too good to be true shall i be on your knee joe asked lily confidingly joe had the sensation of home brewed very strongly he was conscious that he must not have much more of this heady delight you are big lily's flattery was obvious but sufficiently subtle for joe you're a bit of honey that's what said joe rapturously like to kiss me joe there was a short silence 
You don't like kissing, I can see, Lily commented disappointedly. Not like it, Joe gasped. Well, you kiss as soft as a hen pecking bread. I'll show ye if I like it. Oh, dear, you've knocked my bonnet off, my hair. It's all right, all curly like a young lamb and shining. This was sweet to Lily as homage to a king dethroned. She leant back against his shoulder. He kissed her again. They were in the little wood. Her eyes sought his bewitchingly as she lay in apparent abandon to the sweetness of the kiss. She was wondering how many more hints she must give him before he would speak. Joe kissed her throat. Then he put her on the ground, roughly. "'We best go home,' he said. "'Why?' She was petulant, not having as yet attained her object. "'I want to do right by you, Lil, and your soul. I cannot remember aught when you're like you be tonight.' "'How do you mean, right by me?' Joe took a deep breath. "'I mean, will you wed me, Lil, my dear?' "'Well, why, ever couldn't you say that before?' thought Lily. She smiled. "'I might. Soon. Maybe. Come on home, Lil. The devil's in this little old wood.' He walked furiously down the track, Lily half running, not understanding the fires she had kindled so carefully. When? asked Joe, slackening speed as they neared home. I don't know. Next week? Well, Saturday next, as ever is. Oh, Joe. Saturday it is, then, and no more little wood till then, for you're like home brewed, little. He gazed at her in puzzled and admiring wonder. And you remember, as it means no going back to your father, if you marry me quick, see? Lily did see had seen all along with a clearness that would have startled Joe. "'There is a cottage at sleep, not set. I'll take it. We only want a few chairs and a table and a mangle, to begin with, and a double bed.' He stopped. "'My tongue's hung on in the middle,' he muttered. There was a short silence. "'I don't know as it can be Saturday, after all,' said Lily at last. In Deborah's small whitewashed room, with God is love over the mantelpiece and a bunch of mimulus in the window, the two girls tossed all night. "'What a cracking them two keep up, like calves in a strawy calfskit,' Joe thought. An intolerable sweetness came over him as he let his sleepy thoughts wander on to next Saturday. "'There's surely no harm in thinking of it now, it being all settled up,' he reasoned. Besides, I mun get used to it, or I'll never remember all the things I've got to remember. Hark at those girls, said Mrs. Arden to John. They're both in love. Or it may be heat lumps, John suggested. Dear sakes, what a man! Mrs. Arden would have her romance. Lily was faced by the necessity of a decision, a thing she hated. There were three ways open to her, and she must traverse one of them, since she could not stay where she was. All were equally detestable to her. She could go home, be a dairy maid, or become the mother of Joe's children. She writhed at the idea of physical endurance. She did not love, and it is love that makes all pain, all privation, a crown of everlastings. The lover knows that the reward is greater than the hardship. To Lily, who had never cared for any creature, it was not so. She had always supposed that sometime she would have children, but now that the vague future had come near, it was a different matter. So much for Joe then. But could she go home? No. The dairymaid's situation remained. Not if I know it, she said. Work, work, day in, day out. She came back to Joe. An idea struck her. With a pathetic mingling of naivete and selfishness, she decided that she and Joe could be brother and sister. As she had not divined anything of Joe's nature or his dreams, for intuitions do not come to the self-centered, this resolve was not so heartless as it seemed. Having come to a satisfactory decision, Lily curled up to sleep like a kitten. Deborah half awoke. "'He's coming to high leisures,' she thought, "'to see me. Me, not Lily.' She was astonished at his blindness. Lily was so pretty." She was glad with a boundless joy. Already on the horizon of her life flickered the immortal fires, darting strange rays, changing the world. Stephen! Stephen Southernwood! 
A dart of pride ran through her as she remembered that Lily had not lured his eyes from her once. Stephen, she said aloud, half asleep. Keep your silly names to yourself, can't you? grumbled Lily. But Deborah was asleep. Stephen, she murmured again. Oh, cried Lily, much irritated. Joe, 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 then, if it's got to be said. She cried from sheer vexation. End of chapter 10